So these are the five key uh, dimensions that we are looking into, and I can elaborate later if you want to uh, further explore and understand how we systematically mainstream this green growth in development planning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And um, I'm just going to stand here for the final bit. Um, I also wanted to thank peers for drawing attention to the fact that it is odd to be talking about investment and opportunities to scale up responsible practices in the Indonesian palm oil sector without having a producer on stage. Um, we did have one who, until a couple of days ago, uh, was actually uh, intending to participate in, in, in the uh, symposium, but for due to uh, emerging issues, then the company was una unable to join. Um, I have made an effort to reach out to a number of companies that we, um, I work together, I work at uh, Demo2 Consulting based here in Indonesia. Um, we work with a number of um, uh, leading uh, palm oil producers in Indonesia, reached out to a number of those for commentary on some of the key issues that we will be talking about, and, I'll, and I will make reference to some of the inputs and comments that we've gotten from them through the course of our discussion today. Um, I would, however, also like to echo uh, Phil, uh, uh, Piers' invitation to the audience that among us, um, I uh, can't see up to the crowd so clearly today, uh, but if there is anyone in the audience who is a producer, uh, who would, I encourage you to participate very actively um, in, in our discussion today. Um, okay, thank you very much, everyone. We're a bit behind schedule, so we're gonna run right into our uh, questions that we've prepared uh, for today. Um, again, broadly speaking, we have sort of two sets of issues that we wanna tackle. Looking at community development and smallholder participation and, and benefit sharing um, in palm oil and also a broad range of issues related to uh, planning and, and mitigation of environmental impacts. Um, we've separated those somewhat artificially for part of the discussion, although they're gonna be woven together as uh, questions um, carry on. Uh, but I wanna begin um, by making an observation that um, palm oil companies potentially contribute positively to communities in, in three very broad areas. Um, number one is through the, the, the rolling out of successful smallholder programs where communities are brought into the palm oil production process. A second is through contributions to livelihoods um, that are achieved through um, the, the construction of uh, the development of infrastructure, development of market linkages, direct job creation and related um, livelihood sort of programs. And the third is through the direct provision of social services. Now, the question that I'd like to ask um, our panel to begin is with these three areas in mind, um, what do you see as some of the main challenges faced by producers? in making uh, positive uh, contributions to local community development, um, even when they are genuinely committed to the task of doing that. Um, and to begin, I'd like to direct that question uh, first to peers, and then to have you follow on with that, Adrian. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, so we're talking here about producers, we're talking predominantly about palm oil plantation companies working right. upstream, yeah? Yeah. Who, you know, in, in uh, my, my experience is based here predominantly in Indonesia, who, who face a number of significant uh, business-related challenges um, in terms of working in the Indonesian environment um, in oil palm. Um, without going into a, a huge amount of detail, I guess predominantly one of the, two of the major problems that the, the plantations face is the relationship between land rights, land tenure, and legislation, or a, a land law that exists in Indonesia. Um, with the decentralization of Indonesia that occurred the most important thing is to be certified. I think um, as we see the certification world first came out and it was RSP alone, and then after that came the new REN, after that came the US requirement, and after that came the ISP and it seems like all of these requirements come on top of everybody. And even though suppliers such as big companies don't have much difficulty meeting the priority area, you see that the risk is that you have about 41% small values. Indonesia, which might have been catching up. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, people like um, in Solidaridad, IDH, and all of the other, other um, SNVs and everybody else who's offering buy-in from small holders. But, you know, the way it is is that the buy-in from a bigger company is very different. You see that in Indonesia, the, the, the small holders are, will have to live with the, the uh, Bigger foundation. It's not like in Malaysia, where Malaysia has felt that it's more so. In Indonesia, the, the format is um, that small holders are selling fruits to a bigger company. So I think with increasing sustainability requirements and all these um, 
market demand and all the other demands from everybody else on sustainability for palm. We kind of ask this question whether um, these smallholders, uh, who, who, who is a big portion of the region, can catch up to those requirements. And if they can catch up, who is going to help them catch up? Is it the responsibility of the plantation? Is the government playing a role? How are the NGOs helping and all of that? So I think. Um, we, we're talking directly. The smallholders are the biggest portion of the plantation industry, and we have to think about how can we include them in the global market mm. in terms of my perspective. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Um, in, in, I, I'd like we're going to spend about at least another ten minutes talking about smallholder issues in Indonesia, and I think for the benefit of the audience, um, some of you may know this very well already. But, uh, many of you may not. Um, that. You know, in speaking about smallholders, it's very important to understand some of the heterogeneity that we have within that. Um, very broadly speaking, smallholders in Indonesia fall into two, two broad classes. Those who are independent, truly independent farmers uh, with no ties of any kind to a company, free to sell their uh, fresh fruit bunches to whomever they wish. Another class are, the, are smallholders who are tied um, to companies through credit and contractual arrangements. Now, the variety of these contractual uh, and these partnership arrangements between smallholders and um, sponsoring companies in Indonesia are incredibly diverse. Uh, they've changed markedly um, over time. But broadly speaking, today in Indonesia, there are, are uh, two different models um, that, that, that we see predominating uh, most of the market in these relationships between companies and smallholders tied to them. Um, so I, I'm going to ask Piers very quickly to take a moment to describe um, these two uh, different uh, models that, that predominate most of the partnership arrangements in, in, in Indonesia today, and then we're going to explore that a little bit. Uh, okay, sure. I, I'm going to keep this quite brief. Uh, yep. but, but, but certainly echo what you've said about the fact that although there may be two broad um, groups, uh, in essence, in reality, in the field, there is uh, a, a far greater um, efflorescence. There's a far greater diversity of the types of partnerships that occur in a modern day oil palm plantation. Um, and that's come about um, because of legislation from 2004, and it's come about from legislation in 2007. Um, so I'll, I'll spend a bit of time perhaps uh, talking about that notion of, of, of in Indonesian is known as kamitraan, which is partnership plantations, um, rather than focusing on the past. Yep. In, in, the past in the past, since the 1970s, there's been a whole gamut of plantation arrangements um, relating to what's known, and most people I think in the room would know about that idea of inti plasma, um, uh, which is a, a relationship between a, a company, generally with a mill, um, which has its own land, and then surrounding um, uh, plasma or uh, smallholder plots of varying, varying forms. And throughout the 1980s, um, there was a whole range of, of, of plantation arrangements, uh, schemes known as, as, as Pier, Pier Trans, and Pier Bun, um, Pier Excelavasi. Um, these are all iterations of the, the, that, that, that general um, plantation arrangement. Um, through the 90s, you moved into this uh, um, Indonesian term of kakapea, uh, which is more of a, um, uh, what, what we would term in English, I guess, of a, 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 a shareholding arrangement, um, or arrangement whereby smallholders are tied to a particular plantation uh, in terms of their FFB, their fresh fruit bunches going to a mill. Um, but that was quite a, a change in terms of the traditional peer uh, plantation arrangement. Um, and then you had these notions of kamitra'an partnership and uh, revitalisasi or revitalisation of plantations, which bring that, which bring us up to the last uh, 10 or 15 years or so, which, which develop um, a diversity of, of land division arrangements, um, profit sharing arrangements, um, and so on and so forth. So, and, and you do get tremendous diversity even within districts um, in terms of plantation arrangements. So you may have um, a particular road, for example, on the left hand, you may have a government plantation that is still using a, a system um, of what's known as peer trans, or trans migrants who were moved from Java um, or other areas in Indonesia, populated places, to work on plantation companies in uh, Sumatra and Kalimantan. And then literally five metres across the road, you'll have a more modern, modern form of uh, kamitraan, or partnership, whereby you'll have a shareholding arrangement where a plantation will actually undertake all the work in terms of the agricultural process, um, and then the smallholder will have given up a proportion of their land, uh, and then they will receive a monthly income 
cut with administration costs, transportation costs, fruit grading costs, um, and credit costs, which have to be paid back, um, and that will be their, their, their um, contribution and their income that they receive on a monthly basis. Uh, thank you, Pierce. So we have, broadly speaking today, we have sort of two, two different models. One in which you have farmers that actively participate in the, in the, in the production of, of fresh fruit bunches on land that they make available to companies planting oil palm. Um, another is uh, in which they hand, uh, permit palm oil companies to, to develop on their land and receive in exchange for that, uh, basically a dividend that we paid on a roughly two month basis, uh, minus all of the expenses and costs that, uh, that peers, peers have referred to. Um, I've, um, you know, in, in thinking about you know, this, this question of, of, of investments that can be um, mobilized to overcome some of the bottlenecks that are part of making smallholder um, uh, smallholder programs successful in Indonesia. And so what I have in mind here is sort of in this, this, this class of smallholders who are tied to plantation companies that can support the success and development of these programs. Um, one thing about what sorts of investments um, uh, can be addressed, uh, can be mobilized um, to, to, to improve performance of those arrangements. Um, uh, I've asked a couple of, of, of um, producers. Uh, learning a database which can actually be shared with other people, since this is a company based, it will definitely be quite difficult. But I think um, one of the biggest questions that needs to be answered as well is that if we have plasma covered by all these um, corporations, what happens to dependence on all of the If I you know, some kind of investment is kind of system and kind of help them improve the infrastructure and also have them train and all them, uh, you know, doing the right thing. Because um, doing the, the worst parts of the palm industry, the, uh, in the public, in, for example, uh, on the ones that we get from Singapore here, the ones we get from Finland, such as the haze, the deforestation and everything else. Uh, farmers, bigger farm companies claim that they're not doing it with all the SOPs and all the audits that's been done. But how about the other small farmers that are doing it? The ones that they claim are probably doing it. Is how, how do we actually reach out to them? How do we invest in them and to make sure that you know, some kind of um, responsibility is given to make sure that they are doing what the other people are doing? Some kind of Investment scheme is kind of lacking in that area, and I think that I think that's what you mean, right? Thank you, thank, thank, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, I want to uh, pose another question that, that links to aspects of what you just talked about, Adrian. Um, uh, the past two, three years um, have seen several smallholder groups become RSPO and IS, ISCC um, certified, both um, smallholders who are fully independent, but find support from, from spon uh, sponsorships from companies, and also smallholders who are tied to, to producers themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this trend towards uh, smallholders becoming certified is a very positive sign. Um, but frequent uh, observation made by um, companies and also groups who work with and support the smallholders is that it's incredibly costly, requires, um, you know, the, the direct fees are, 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 are sizable. Uh, but also the, the technical skills and, and the training and the capacity that's required in order to bring um, production up to uh, the, the standards of certification and also to go through that process are very costly. And a number of people have um, put forward the idea that well, what we need then in order to, to stimulate broader participation of smallholders within the certification uh, movement is innovative financial um, uh, mechanisms to mobilize funding that are not necessarily dependent upon the sponsorship of companies with whom the smallholders may be tied. Um, ben, I, as, a, as a representative, if you will, of the financial um, industry, I'd like to ask... It's, it's, it's a really interesting one because it's so very, very close to impact investing. Mm. And I think there, that's a really fascinating space that we'll see, yeah. I think, the international banks even moving increasingly towards. Um, as you go up to the sort of slightly bigger local and regional banks um, that do a little bit more retail banking, of course, you're, you're, you're going to find those banks active dealing with SMEs. Um, so there's, there's quite a distinct market there. Um, and then you get up to some of the some of the international banks with a very big retail banking presence, and the, the HSBCs and so on. So there's quite actually a lot of distillation. Um, but I, I really think that a lot of the, the real ex 
exciting work. It's happening at the, the kind of microfinance slash impact investing area. Um, a lot is happening at the bottom of the pyramid. I think a lot of this has really been focused on social causes, uh, but we're starting out to see also conservation becoming a little bit more mainstreamed into that. So not so much a huge amount happening at the moment in terms of the products. Um, research is ongoing. Credit Suisse has done some research on this earlier this year. Um, I think you'll see quite a lot more activity and innovation space in the coming couple of years. Great, uh, thank you very much, Ben. Um, Adrian, I'm gonna assume that you heard that, and I'm gonna put one very quick question to you. I know that Neste has been involved providing support, and, and as I understand, direct finance in some form, to the certification of independent smallholders. Um, is this, uh, do you see um, a niche, a function that could be scaled um, on the, the downstream buyer side of things? provide finance and support smallholders uh, becoming certified? Yep, it's a, um, it's a model that can be done. Uh, but the thing is um, that we're the only buyer that's buying these certified oil, it seems. Uh, so that's quite difficult. So um, we've, we um, did it for the first batch of smallholders applying to us. We, we paid for the certification uh, for it. And um, I think that model is quite doable. It's basically having a willing Mill is going to be certified and a good mill which has a good relationship with their smallholders. And those smallholders were class one smallholders of um, Golden Agri. So uh, that was a good scheme altogether. Um, however, I think um, the most important thing, as, as, uh, in, as you mentioned and also uh, Ben mentioned just now, is also the uh, involvement of financial institutions. I think would be interesting, especially if you move to uh, other smallholders. Which, Kind of financing is required for training. It's scalable, it definitely is. Um, there are institutions with money, as we all know, that um, most important thing is it's going to buy the certified oil and um, actually who is the downstream player that is willing to, to do it because um, I think it's always easier to certify your own estate than mm. to certify independent, you said. Yeah, independent as well. It is more challenging. Uh, we're looking into projects at the moment in this state to get independent smallholders in uh, doing discussions with a lot of um, stakeholders, including uh, you know, NGOs and all, all of those. So hopefully, in, uh, sometime this week, will be announced. Great. Okay. Good. Thank, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, I'm going to, uh, at this stage, we're at um, sort of well into the point where we were going to open this up uh, to questions. I've got a number of questions that I uh, would still like to ask of the panel, but I'm going to pause at this stage just for a moment to um, open uh, the floor to questions. Anybody have something you'd like to ask? Thank you. Uh, Faisal Parish, uh, Global Environment Centre, Malaysia. Um, one of the challenges that we're working particularly on the issue of peat fires and transboundary haze in the ASEAN region. And this is one of the major sources of the land degradation and uh, unsustainable management that we see is the small and medium scale development of oil palm on peat. That's, but the challenge, obviously the larger companies have the capability technically and financially to invest properly in proper water management uh, but it's the small to medium scale operators where most of the problems of water management are. And one of the challenges which is uh, faced for those legitimate small scale operators, how do they get access to the financial resources to invest in proper mechanization for land, land management? And I think because of that gap, everyone takes the cheap option, which is set fire to everything and that will clear the land. And that's giving the major problem that we're facing. I think it can only be solved by having an effective mechanism to get the uh, right finance in the right way, but in a managed way. So uh, I don't know whether the panel members can give a comment. There's been comment about microcredit, but it just needs to be not credit to anyone, but credit in a controlled way that legitimate players within, with guidance can get resources for proper uh, land development in peatland or rehabilitation of peatland areas which have already been opened up. Thank you. 
Um, thank you. Um, ben, I hope you don't mind, but I, it's, it's, we're, we're, I'm going to uh, ask you to address this question initially, and maybe we have other members of the panel would like to chime in. Um, I think what there is, though, is something of a paucity of local regional banks that would be sitting in that financing niche that may necessarily have oil palm standards. Um, and one of the challenges that we face as a, as a block of financial institution members within RSPO is getting the getting the local and the regional banks to, to, to get a bit more involved. Um, there's quite a lot of outreach that's going on in that regard. It's slow progress. Um, I, I think at this point I would give a nod to OCBC, which last year became the first Asian domicile bank to become a member of RSPO. Um, but, you know, given that we have 2,000 delegates at this conference, um, I, I think, you know, there's banks here, there's a lot of private sector interest, many, many different sizes of companies. Um, we'd really like to, to sort of do our bit through this conference and ongoing engagement as a block of um, institutions for RSPO to get the, the, other, the other local regional banks involved. I think this is just critical. And there's definitely a case of the tall poppy syndrome where you stick your head up, particularly as a bank, you get it, you get it knocked off. Um, so there's, you know, we also have to think about the incentives, what would actually make a local regional bank get involved in an organization like RSPO, I mean, what's in it for them? Um, we need to come up with good answers. Thank you. Um, in this, this particular uh, question, you know, it's, it's drawing attention to a need for finance, it's actually obtaining finance even from, from local sources, mesoscale finance. Um, makes me wonder if there might be an opportunity for partnership of some form between the private sector and local governments in the specific geographies that we're talking about, where you could look at a facility that would be rolled out in, su partial, in, in support of the private sector would be making an effort committing to best practices in the way that they're developing plantations. So, I don't know if you want to speak to that, you don't necessarily, it's just an observation that I could see that as one potential opportunity getting over this limitation of, of collateral and reputation. Yeah, I, I, I would if I can take the opportunity. I mean, I think it's very important to, if we're talking about the smaller and medium plantation companies and the problems that are being experienced in the field as the, uh, the, the, the question came through, I mean, it's, it's absolutely critical not to forget ISPO in this. Um, you know, that, that ISPO, if we are going to, I mean, Everyone in the room here needs to begin perhaps thinking about how are we going to support ISPO and the Ministry of Agriculture and the Department of Plantations engage in better management practices across it as part of a, a, a supply chain of palm oil, as part of, from the end user all the way through to that plantation. And ISPO is going to be that tool that is going to be able to, and, and it relates also directly to Adrian's point about independent smallholders. Um, so, you know, um, the, the role that ISPO plays in this, uh, complementary to RSPO, is, is, is going to be very critical in this. Um, and I was, I was, you know, again heartened this morning to hear um, from members of Kadin uh, about um, some of the plans of uh, the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce to become involved in uh, smallholder training and, and smallholder engagement. Um, you know, and ISPO has been very clear um, in terms of um, legality of independent smallholders and supporting uh, legal independent smallholders um, as a very important part and challenge of what they're going to do. So ISPO, you know, and ISPO is, a, is, a very, is going to be a very critical part of this moving forward. The, the, just one final point about banks as well is that, um, you know, the whole microfinance issue is, is, a, is always a very complex one regardless of the commodity. But of course, BRI have been working on this for many, many years in Indonesia, for 100 years. Uh, uh, BNI have been working on this, CIMB have been working on this. Um, a, a number of Indonesian banks have been working in this sort of field as well. Um, so, uh, you know, and again, this has been spoken about this morning, of that creating, creating those sort of banking products um, where you have lag times to allow for alternative or multi-cropping, or, um, you know, the, the lay time before plantations become mature. Um, and, and, and that's difficult for banks in terms of risk and in terms of, um, in terms of return on investment and, and, and country risk and things like that. But, mm -hmm. but um, you know, there are certainly many people working in that, um, in that, in that field in, in Indonesia. Okay, it's interesting. I just want to make a quick observation that you know, you're right, it appears to draw attention to. There's no shortage of banks in Indonesia that have been doing microcredit and you know, miso finance. Um, there are many of them. I, I guess what we're talking about is, is finance, it's, it's a new product for a, a demand, which is um, you know, advancing credit in support of smallholders achieving RSPO or other forms of certification, which is in itself brand new 
and this is not, there may be you know, million, million, tens of hundreds of millions of dollars available for microfinance in Indonesia itself, but this is an innovative product. So the question would be how to, how yeah. to work with banks to, 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 to formulate that. Yeah, but of course, you know, as, as, you know, as you all know, there's, there's, that, there's that, 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 that question immediately has to be asked of if there is certification, what's in yes. for me as a smallholder? Yeah, um, and that's a, that's a significant challenge. We can't just presume that a smallholder in the middle of central Kalimantan or Papua is interested necessarily in a certification process because that's right. not what they're interested in. Yeah? Right. They're interested in, 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 a, in a whole gamut of other things um, that, that either ISPO or RSPO can provide. Okay, fair question. Um, sure, Anna, please. Yes, I could add to this a little bit more as we've heard um, uh, more from the private finance perspectives. I think access to finance uh, for these smallholder groups is equally important coming from the government side as well through uh, driving investments in uh, government budgets, fiscal incentives, other financial incentives or even reward mechanisms that can encourage uh, smallholders to flourish more especially when they implement sustainable practices in, uh, in, in their um, production and in, in their, on their lands. So I think uh, both are important. Of course, the policy uh, and the fiscal incentive road is, is a long path, but it's still extremely necessary to build this more systematic change in driving how governments are investing in, uh, in their lands. And not seeing this as excess of finance per se, but more in, as an investment. So you're getting returns out of this. Right. What are the returns? The returns are for society. Um, and, and this is, I think, uh, a very important uh, part that we need to continue to work on to incentivize these right, uh, more sustainable approaches, um, interventions in palm oil, in the palm oil sectors, as well as taking away perverse incentives that are currently in place. So I think these are some very important things to think about as we move ahead. Great, okay, that's a very good point how to encourage involved uh, government expenditure and support uh, for these, uh, to meet these emerging financial needs. And seeing that as a form of investment that yields very real returns, not necessarily in, mon in direct monetary uh, currencies, but, but in real benefits. Um, I'd, uh, let's, let's return to the floor if there is a, a second uh, question that anybody would like to ask. Got one, two. Let's ask the panel when we talk about uh, using financing to incentivize smallholders for more sustainable practices, um, whether from Credit Suisse or from your, from your own experience, uh, beyond the Cardin uh, case study which we heard from Park Frankie this morning, uh, do you all know of others, other concrete examples of, of how uh, financing, whether at the micro level or at, or at other levels, was used to incentivize uh, um, sustainable behavior from, from smallholders? Adrian, do you want to speak to that? Covering the kind of small models. At the moment, the East Coast system is looking into how they can uh, do more small models into their certification system. And I think if we're looking into a government to government method, especially if Singapore is well much um, affected by Keynes, I think it would be in the interest of the Singapore government. And I put this also into the, um, the Business Council and the Singapore Business Federation at one point to actually talk with the ISPO and the Ministry of Agriculture and see how Singapore can invest in helping the small to get certified and thus more aware of what has been done in the planning and I think that's the challenge. Okay. okay, thanks Adrian. I think we lost the audio at the very end there, but, but, but we heard most of what you, what you were saying. Um, does anybody on the panel want to add any more to that? Yeah, uh, Chairs, I guess you would be the one most qualified to speak to it. Demonstrating. Indonesia's and independent smallholders, particularly in Sumatra, is the lack of good planting materials. Um, I was just wondering to what extent um, either government or um, other agencies are actually getting to grips with that particular problem because inevitably smallholder yields are going to be low if they're using. Um, uh, difficult plant planting materials, inadequate planting materials. And uh, the IFC study, which has happened recently, came up with some very uh, difficult um, conclusions about the actual proportion of smallholders 
in Indonesia, independent smallholders who, who had access to good planting materials. I do think that's a very important point. Great point. Uh, Piers, I know that you've done a lot of thinking and working on this. Uh, um, wave a need that 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 we're that will crest and crash very soon um, among smallholders in Sumatra with poor planting material or senescent trees that are going to be looking at replanting very soon. The question is uh, how to mobilize that that funding, but also how to build into that uh, credit arrangement perhaps some sort of a mechanism that would take into account that there are several years of zero income until the trees that are replanted um, become productive again. So. Uh, Maybe I'll ask this of you first, Ben. Any, um, if you heard yeah. discussions about this and speaking back? Sure. I, I mean, I, I don't have any great insights to this. I mean, more generally, banks will provide financing credit to all sorts of industries, and the conditions that those industries find themselves in, their ability to repay varies depending on you know, internal and external factors. Um, again, just going back to my point before, I, I, I would have thought that the kinds of banks that would be there for those smallholders would have been providing those sorts of tailor-made services for, for some time. Um, you know, I, I guess the credit risk would change, but you know, provided the banks can foresee that their chances of being repaid are going to be there, um, then you know, the private sector will, will, will try its best to do the transaction. Um, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the public sector, maybe there's a role for the government of the, the, sort of the, the local districts in terms of um, some kind of underwriting or some kind of security. Um, but yeah, I, I can't say too much more about that. Okay, well good. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, Chris or Adrian, do you have anything that you'd like to add to uh, this question? I'll give you a second. Chris has a good answer. Smallholders, independent smallholders across Indonesia. And so that extension and that education is a critical part of that. Great. Thank you, Chris. Adrian, anything very quickly you'd like to add to that in 30 seconds or less? Um, basically, uh, two points, I think. Specifically, looking at the policies that um, yeah. we are looking into, and, and as I mentioned before, we need to be thinking further in terms of policies that drive investments to the right direction. But building the case is not easy. Uh, building the case in government because you're involving Ministry of Finance and others who are dealing with budgets and incentives. So how do you build the case to make sure that it's convincing? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, this is what we, 3GI is working on with Government of Indonesia to work from behind and supporting them to build these cases, to develop a, a systematic tool, a tool that can help them see what are the current costs uh, to doing business in this way, specific to palm oil, for example, uh, if, if you know um, forests are being cut down or uh, fertilizers and pesticides pollute the waterways or other forms of, of actions that currently are taken, which actually have a cost mm -hmm. to the environment, cost to society eventually, and cost you know to the private sector as well uh, or the smallholder as well because they are in that same environment. So understanding that and understanding the lost revenue or the benefits that you're foregoing, uh, these are very crucial um, quantitative assessments that need to be done to help build the case and to help governments also see the value of putting an incentive into a certain direction, doing a certain fiscal uh, policy change or taking away a certain perverse um, incentive. Uh, just, just reflecting a little bit on perverse incentives, for example. Um, at the moment, local uh, district level, local tax revenues uh, that are being collected is mostly based on the, side, the, the area of the land. Now, that obviously doesn't really help smallholders from really uh, you know, uh, getting there because this is very much favoring large corporations as well. Uh, also, in, it's also often based on incentives are often also based on um, infrastructure. So when large corporates come into this district, they build the infrastructure. It's often the case that the expectation is that uh, corporations come and they support the building of infrastructure. Well, then it obviously encourages these districts to um, encourage the bigger plantations and not look at sustainability across the board for their people in, in their district. So how do you change those incentive mechanisms to actually 
uh, encourage more smallholders moving into this space um, and not base your incentives on the size of the area, the land that you take, more on land optimization or yield optimization. So in this way, you, you, you change your way of doing incentives uh, at the local districts level. Right. So these, these are some of the things, and I think the key area that we work in, if I come back to that now as you, you, you are questioning what we are doing, um, the work very much looks at these costs and benefits. So it's about building this case. Um, so with the, with the palm oil, we look at the, uh, the interventions that you could take, you could put in place by moving to degraded lands, integrated pest management, using organic fertilizers. What are the opportunities in terms of revenue generation that it could create, as well as the benefits that it would create to uh, the private sector, the smallholder, as well as society. What are these? If you, can, if you can calculate this and if you can really build this case in that way that's strong, that uh, is aimed to drive policy into that direction. Um, that's, that's some of the work that uh, we're working on. Great. Thank you, Anna. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to check by my watch. We've got five minutes. Am I correct? Five? Yes? Yes. Okay, good. All right, we're all on the same time here. Uh, thank you, Anna, for that very interesting piece of things to come back to. Um, if there is one question on the floor that can be asked in the next 30 seconds and that can be answered in one minute following that, I'd encourage anybody to ask that question right now. Anybody? No. Okay. Uh, there's a box on hand. Um, I'm going to... Um, uh, ask each of the panelists one uh, one question. Ask each of you to answer it in, in roughly um, uh, a minute. And it's a little, I promise it's not, it sounds like a bit of a cutesy question, but I, I just want to leave with a clear statement from each of you what you see as kind of the, the, the major investment priorities. And the question is if you had 10 to 20 million dollars that you could invest um, tomorrow in overcoming uh, a key barrier or bottleneck that you see. Um, in, a, in, in, a, in an area where innovation is necessary. Opportunities are available, but there are constraints.